Jonathan not coming today? I don't think he is. Do you want me to move his thing? We don't know. It's number one. We all ready? Oh, Carl. Lincoln City Council meeting of March 23rd, 2015. Let's all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a period of silent meditation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with LB 898, a copy of the Open Meetings Act is posted at the back of the chamber. The order of business for the City Council is as follows. The clerk will call the items listed on the agenda under public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak on any item should come forward and after the clerk, after the clerk reads that item. The applicant and those in favor should speak first, then those opposed. The applicant may then make one short rebuttal. Each speaker should begin by stating name, address, and whether you are speaking in favor of or in opposition to the item. Testimony is limited to five minutes per speaker. After all public hearings, the council will vote on resolutions items listed under third reading. On the second and last meeting of the month, immediately prior to adjournment, anyone may speak on any issue not on the agenda for that date, nor plan for a future agenda. This is an open, meet, open mic night. Teresa, call the first item, please. Certainly. Public hearing consent agenda, items one through five. Anybody like to speak to these items? Staff questions? Next item, please. All right, if not, we can vote on these items. Item one was introduced by Cook. So moved. Moved by Trent, seconded by Roy. <clears throat> Discussion? <clears throat> Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Items three and four were introduced by Eskridge. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Carried six to zero. Next are our public hearing liquor resolutions. Those giving testimony are asked to come forward and state their names and addresses. I'll call item six, application of JSD LLC doing business as Huskerville Pub and Pizza for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 65 feet by 45 feet at 2805 Northwest 48th Street on May 16th, 2015 from 11 a.m. to 2 a.m. Hi, my name is Sandy McCorkendell Warnicky. My husband and I are co-owners of the Husqvarna Pub and Pizza in Air Park. Um, we have, this is our third time. We've helped um, Harley Davidson host such an event. It's a benefit for the MDA, and um, we are expanding the beer garden outside to to accommodate their requests. So, I'll answer any questions you have. Questions. John. I might make a clarification here just in the future on applications. It says the 16th, but actually you're going over to Sunday morning the 17th. Okay. And so it might be, Teresa, on our applications. We should have that <clears throat> noted accordingly. Otherwise, it could be construed differently. And, and that might be because we stopped the music at midnight. No, you moved. didn't do anything. It's just, oh. it really is. It's 2 a.m. on the 17th, and it reads 11. It, it doesn't say that. So. Yeah, to accommodate the neighbors, we try to close it down by midnight outside. John's point might be though that we're this is not a music license this is a liquor license sure. I bet we're not going to start the we're not going to stop the alcohol I until see. so let's make sure we have the days accurately marked good point thank you we're good thank yeah. you anybody else anybody like to discuss this item next item please 
Next, I'll call items 7 and 8. They're the application of Zipline Brewing Company for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 36 feet by 72 feet at 2100 Magnum Circle on April 11th from, 11, from 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. And for a special designated license to cover an outdoor area measuring approximately 36 feet by 72 feet at 2100 Magnum Circle on May 1st from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Craig Greyer. I'm here again uh, on behalf of Zipline Brewing Company. Uh, we have two upcoming events at our tap room we're spe uh, seeking SDLs for. Uh, you may have seen the news recently about uh, Lincolnite Sean McCabe, who went under underwent an extremely rare double lung and liver transplant in Denver, Colorado, uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, as a result, he's in uh, need of funding for his post-operation care. He's still considerably short of uh, what he needs for the expected costs. Uh, to help out, we're holding a benefit for him in the tap room on his birthday, actually, April 11th. Uh, a number of community partners have donated their time and talents, uh, including two food vendors. Uh, the outdoor area we're seeking to cover with this SDO will be a space for them uh, and for the convenience of our customers uh, in the tap room. Uh, the second one is actually one of those food vendors, Big Loves Barbecue, is uh, finishing up his uh, uh, food truck, and he wants to have a kickoff thing. He's been out a lot and done a lot of good work with us. And uh, he just wants, we want that area again, same amount of space. Out, it's about a fourth of the parking lot. Uh, it wouldn't affect any of the other tenants. It's, it's just in front of our space there. Um, thank you very much for considering your application. Take any questions. Thank you. Anybody who'd like to discuss these items? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody who'd like to discuss this either item? Next item, please. All right, next I'll call item nine, application of Omaha Exposition and Racing, doing business as Lincoln Race Course for a special designated license to cover outdoor area me areas measuring approximately 45 feet by 80 feet and 17 feet by 70 feet at 7055 South First Street on April 30th through May 3rd, 2015 from 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. Hi, my name is Christy Harris, and I'm with Lincoln Race Course. And what this is, this is Kentucky Derby weekend, and so we would, we're going to have a band on Friday night and on Saturday night. This will allow um, we put a tent up and it'll allow additional seating for the patrons to come in. Okay. Anybody who'd like to speak to this item? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody who'd like to speak to this item? Next item, please. All right, I'll call item 10, application of Parker's <clears throat> Rib Branch, doing business as Parker's Smokehouse to expand its class IK liquor license to include an additional licensed area described as a one-story, irregular-shaped building approximately 110 feet by 100 feet, including walk-in cooler approximately 8 feet by 18 feet at 8341 O Street. Anybody who would like to speak to this item? Okay. Anybody in the, anybody in the audience who'd like to speak to this item? Mr. Chair, would this be one since it's just expansion that they wouldn't need to appear or? What would I'm good with that. I'll take that. It's fine with me. Okay. Fine. I move approval of uh, items six through ten. Second. Second by Roy. Discussion. Call the roll. Eskridge. Yes. Fellers. Yes. Gaylor Baird. Yes. Camp. Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Next would it be our public hearing resolutions. Item 11 is amending the fiscal year 1415 CIP to authorize and appropriate $374,000 in TIF funds for the Swanson Russell redevelopment project. Good afternoon, City Council members. I'm Dallas McGee with the City Urban Development Department. Uh, this resolution complements a resolution that was before you three weeks ago when you approved the redevelopment agreement with Swanson Russell. It authorizes the TIF to be amended as part of our CIP project, $374,000, and would be used for public improvements and public enhancements related to that project. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Okay, thank you, Dallas. Thank you. Anybody who'd like to speak to this item? 
Next item, please. All right, I'll call item 12, authorizing acceptance of the low bid to Brennan Jones, which is in excess of 25% over the estimate for the 36th and Gladstone Paving District 2631. Chairman, members of the council, Roger Figert representing Public Works. Don Todd is also here in case you have questions. The uh, secretary's handing out just a little bit nicer and clearer picture than what was in your packet. At last week or the week before, the council had asked Public Works and Planning and Law to get together and discuss, discuss a couple of options, one of which was perhaps the vacation of the roadway. In your packet this week, Don Todd, uh, reference the meeting that Public Works Planning and Law had, reference the, uh, the legalities and the process in which one would go through to vacate uh, that right away. To make a long story short, um, the applicant for the paving district was not interested in vacating that right away, wants to preserve that right away adjacent to his property. Public works and planning uh, are reluctant and do not recommend vacating that right away just based on future need for growth and redevelopment and changes that might occur in that area. So you have that information. We're here to answer any questions. I do believe that uh, Mr. Ayers is here and wants to present to you as well, and there may be other property owners here as well and we'll stand ready to answer any questions. Uh, if you don't have any right now, if you do have some right now, I'd try to answer those or wait till we get to the end. Trent. Um, Gladstone to the east of the corner into the heirs and heirs property, is that his or is that ours, our right of way? It's public right of way on over to the trailer court. So that's also platted right away for the future that could be developed or paved on into the future. Developer paved. So somebody would have to come along and pave that. If and when there was a need for that, yes, or desire or request for that, yes. But that seems to be where his access point is and where he's accessing his property right now, right? Now, right? Yes, but and he'll explain that, but I think okay. he had discussed by virtue of the fact that his, his goal and desire was to pave 36th Street and be, he oriented his buildings and a future building on to the north to all take access off the proposed paved street at 36th Street. Okay, I just was looking over, over this well, on the Google map of, over the weekend and thought that's where the access point is right now, but I'll, I'll wait for him to make his presentation to ask okay. more questions. Sure. Anything else? Any good questions? Thank you. Anybody who'd like to speak to this item, please come forward. Good afternoon. I'm Mike Ayers uh, with Ayers and Ayers here speaking in support of the paving district. I have a short presentation. I also have a hard copies if anyone would like to see. Okay, I don't think I did that right. Here comes the, the help. I tried hard. <laughs> if you do have hard copies, I'd sure appreciate one, and maybe my colleagues would as well. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Go ahead. Hey, there were some questions last week as to the request and the um, some of the facts, I think, surrounding the development, so I wanted to bring the council square with some of this. Um, the red line on the drawing represents the road um, on the south exposure is Gladstone. It comes to 36th Street, which then heads north for approximately two blocks. Um, the, the property that we own is to the east of the line. Um, you can see, I put specifically that the ground to the north of us is owned I-1. Um, that the, that the uh, creek bed is significantly to the north, but that land is zoned I-1 in that area. Okay, that didn't work. Okay. Didn't work either. I'm 0 for 2 here. <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you. Why don't you sit right there? Yeah. <laughs> sit right there. Because I'm worried about one of you getting tired coming up and back. There you go. There you go. This is off the, the city's website regarding the zoning. The, the pink color represents the I-1 zoning of the area. 
The yellow is an R5 zoning, which is really the trailer park area adjacent to the east, but shows this area all being I-1. It also designates uh, 37th Street as well as a designated street, which would be the opposite side of us, which should Gladstone continue to the east, 37th could attach to that as well. So I wanted to put that in perspective. Mm -hmm. And this also shows out the property that was at the southwest corner of the site, which we didn't own when we first did the development and we first built a building on the site. So the question was asked, why did you access from the south and why are you asking to change that now? Yeah, I think that's very relevant. Uh, uh, it was my understanding back in 2005 when we built the building and we bought and that I understood the obstacle. We orientated the building to address the orientation of the building to the east or excuse me to the west. Uh, we have our front door, our shop located on that and we've facilitated our site um, access in and around our site off of that 36th Street uh, potential opening. Okay. Um, this is a little bit of a, of a clearer picture of that, um, but it shows the two block space and the ground that's adjacent to the north of us. I want to point out to everyone across the, the north edge, there's quite a tree line there, and there is, uh, um, and we'll show some other pictures of what's accumulated over time along that line. And I can also show that on the east side of the property, the future of 37th Street, or as the city map shows it as 37th Street as well. Um, this is a picture uh, looking east from the intersection of 35th and Gladstone, and it's kind of hard to tell unless you drive out there, but the road over time has displaced itself significantly to the south, and there's really a, a small road there. Uh, not because of me, but the utility departments have added a couple of uh, power poles there that show the true orientation of the street, which shows how far over to the north it would be. So instead of having just a one-way lane, or basically for us to drive in to the uh, along uh, Gladstone, this would widen the road and, and actually fit the perspective of a commercial road as well. Okay? Um, this is the orientation as you come and then you turn northeast from Gladstone looking into our building and basically what you see is we have a fence along that entire two blocks. The road there has been graded. We've been actually maintaining that and keeping that area mowed and cleaned up over time, but we have no access from that side of the road and our access really is for this building and then a future building to the north there and then potential other growth out there. And so then our access of our yard has been set up from an access point off of the west side of the lot. This is our current access. This uh, access is off of the southeast corridor of the building. We have a gate there, um, but this is all rock and no paving's been facilitated because I'm looking for a long-term solution for what we're going to facilitate. Um, this is a, the property to the north of us. This has actually been accessed, I believe, from the uh, uh, ground to the east or northeast of us, but it's generally a dumping ground. So, you know, putting this road in isn't going to uh, clean that mess up, but, and I don't believe create further access, people are getting back there to, to hide their goods anyway. So my goal would be to address the area, clean it up and, and develop that ground. That shows the ground to the north that is zoned I-1. It is in the floodplain. I do a lot of commercial work and there's a lot of our property in our community that's in the floodplain and those issues can be dealt with. And this is just a little bit further picture and it shows the north end that we have an existing fire plug. The water's been taken out to the north off of that section of the road. So it's been set up to facilitate this paving district. Um, I tried to reach out. There was some discussion last week about, hey, what can we do to, to help uh, level the playing field for the residentials that are along Gladstone? I went over on Thursday night and sp uh, spoke to the two landowners and gave them this copy of each that said, hey, you know, we'll try to do our part and try to pay, you know, work out with you exactly what the legalities of that are. I don't know that I'm 100%, but I went and approached them and said, hey, the difference between residential and commercial, we'll pay the burden of that. So I did that last Thursday. And right. to date, I don't believe I, I don't, I haven't heard from either of the neighbors, but um, we had a nice chat. Okay. Questions? Who owns the land of the north? I don't know. I thought during the course of the week and as of Friday that I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. um, so, so currently your access is, is via North 37th Street. No, it's no. basically off Gladstone at the very corner uh, intersection of 37th and Gladstone, but we're actually on Gladstone. Okay. 
So to get to it, do you go 35th or 37th? I go 35th. I come in on 35th, which is mm -hmm. uh, off of Cornhusker, where the Arby's is located. Right. I go down to the <clears> intersection <throat> of Gladstone, turn to the east for uh, about a block and a half, a block plus a little bit, and okay. then access the entrance to the uh, yard. Okay. And <clears throat> your Tell us a little bit about the, the numbers of vehicles and the types of vehicles that you have and the road conditions that you have in, in getting there. Okay, well, we the road is, it actually is a city street. I don't know that the city does much to address it or take care of it. We've, um, we have, uh, there's some rock that they placed along that road. It's pretty narrow, um, but uh, we've made it all work over time. We've been doing this for 15 years, so we've made it work. The, uh, we have, uh, not a lot, a lot of traffic, but construction-related traffic. A lot of material deliveries or, or access to our construction materials. We have a, a hook truck and some dump boxes that we facilitate and store there. We also then have uh, you know construction-related equipment in and out of the yard. Lots of scaffolding, lots of form work, lots of that type of stuff. Um, our employees uh, will meet there to park there to, to, to congregate to go to job sites. So we do have, you know, employee traffic on that road as well. Um, the entire, or the majority of the pop property is fenced. We have a small parking area on the south side, but we'd look, when you can see when you go back to the original site plan, that when the road goes in or the area for the road, basically we go back to the fence that we've built. So, and that fence uh, shows where that would sit in reference. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else who'd like to speak to this item? Please come forward. Come on up. <clears throat> Go ahead, come on up. I'm Ron Beeman. I live at 3520 Gladstone. And, uh, I was just wondering, uh, as I didn't know if this was legal, and I didn't know what the price, the numbers were on it before, and this is one of those, the ones he has on file right here, and I'm just not sure if, if it's uh, still legal. Uh, I, I thought. The, I, I think I thought that the, agreement <laughs> is between Mr. Ayers and you, and we're not involved. Well, that's, uh, that's what I thought. I thought since you suggested okay. it, then he comes up with it. I thought you guys were in, involved. So uh, I, we, don't, we don't get to be involved, I don't think. All right. I'll, I'll ask our attorney, but I don't think our attorney wants us up here brokering a deal. Right. Well, but, but I think that uh, public or the en engineer could provide the numbers he's looking for, the difference between the residential and the commercial. Is this the number? Okay. Yes, in, in the attachment on there that you guys got, um, best estimate with the bid, his would have been 41976 and I'll give you copies of it. And the amount after the subsidy would go down to 27662 so 42 to 27. It's about $15,000 subsidy for that property, approximately. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I, I guess I support it. I, I, I don't think you put it out here in, in front of the public and then not go forward with the deal. Okay. Well, that's. Okay. Well. <laughs> well. All right. If if they'll do this, will happen. I'll, I'm. I'm for it. Thank you. Mr. Beeman. Mr. Beeman, I just I want to thank you and your neighbors too for yeah, the I questions agree. you raised and so forth. It made the process work great. It's a big change, but and I think all parties involved, thank you for at least having the discussion, okay? Thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak to this item? I just want to say thank you to Mike of Airs and Airs. I'm Terry Pope Gonzalez, founder of the Neighborhood Association, Salt Creek Area Neighborhood Association, in memory of Joe and Scout Gonzalez. Psalms 91 reminds us to behave. 
402-499-5716. Mike and I, I didn't know he was going to be here. <coughs> we were on the Salvation Army Board together. He's a class act. At least he approached the residential. Our mess where we're at, we never got any approach from anybody. So I want to say, at, at least Mike took the time to, to approach them. And Mike, I want to say thank you to Mike. He's a class act. Okay. And he didn't pay me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else would like to speak to this item? Quick, come quickly or forever? Hi, I'm Susan Woida, and I'm here to speak against the paving project. My husband owns J and J Diesel Service, and as I told you last week, the proper our property value was property was valued at ninety five thousand six hundred dollars in two thousand fourteen. The new estimated amount of thirty eight thousand three hundred dollars is now forty percent of our assessed property value, down from forty two percent. Even with the new estimated amount, this will be an extreme financial burden for our small family owned business. Not only will we be paying off the cost of building this street, a street that we do not need or want, I assume that our property taxes will go up, making it even more of a hardship for us. This is a project that will cost more than $400,000 for a road that leads to nowhere and only benefits one business and will be a final financial hardship for everyone involved. Um, I'd like to also mention that this was brought up in 2001, or 2000, 2002, and it was denied because Mike Ayers did not have majority of the frontage. But even though he did not have majority of the frontage, in 2005, he built his building thinking he was going to still get that. Never con he never contacted any of the business owners ahead of time to say, hey, this is what I would like to do. Would you guys be in favor of it? Nothing like that. Um, this lady mentioned that, yes, he approached the homeowners only after it appeared this wasn't going to work. So um, I don't know. It, like I said, this is going to be a very financial, much of a financial hardship for our family-owned business. <coughs> and I also have some pictures that I took. Um, there you go. <coughs> is that there? Okay. Um, this is from Gladstone, looking down to Hartley. And as you can see, um, here's the neighbor's fences, and here's the other fence lines. So he may have planned on having access to his property, but we did not ever plan to use that property um, to use the road. This is a picture of Mr. Beeman's house. Across the street, this here is um, Gladstone, and his fence is going to need to be replaced, taken out. This is the fence for um, a, our business neighbor, Progressive Electric. Um, they were one of the businesses that stayed neutral on this because they do do a lot of work for heirs and heirs. Guess I really can't blame them for that, but it puts a hardship on the rest of us. Here's the fence line. For our business, we do have a gate, but that's only so we can get, come out and mow in between to mow the assessed property or the easement. Um, this is a fence for leading <coughs> so on, um, Olston's property. Down here is the end of um, 36th Street. So that's all I've got. Good questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak to this item, please come forward. <clears throat> I'm Jim Woida, 8700 Pearl Road, and I'm still against the paving district because, uh, like I said, I'm a small business. I have a mortgage on the property, and with the increasing cost of insurance and everything else, it's just harder and harder to make ends meet, and this is just another expense that's going to make make it harder to make ends meet and uh, the other thing is he had never ever 
when he built the building, bought the property, he'd never talked to any of us property owners in the area about how he oriented the building and his need for 36th Street or whether we were in favor of it or not. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Anybody else like to speak to this item? Staff questions? Roger, do you want to discuss the length of payment and some of that for us, please, just for public knowledge? For paving, uh, property owners have 20 years to pay that back, so the assessment is divided into 20 equal installments, and then each year one of those installments needs to be paid plus the interest that's accrued on the total at that point in time. And it can be paid off faster than that if they want to do additional increments, but they need to do, uh, each one of those installments needs to be in full. So 20 years to pay that back. What's the current interest rate charged on this? Uh, sorry, Mr. Camp, I do not have that number in front of me. Um, it would have been whatever the previous interest when they sold the bonds uh, for that account, and I don't have that number, John. Sorry. I could get that number for you. All right. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Anybody else who'd like to speak to this item? Next item, please. Call item 13, approving an advertising agreement between the City, Parks and Rec, City Golf Courses, and Benchcraft Company, which will provide revenue from advertisement at all five municipal golf courses and will provide scorecards, benches, and other supplies and equipment for each course at no cost. Good afternoon, Lynn Johnson with Lincoln Parks and Recreation. Uh, this is a continuation of this hearing uh, for this advertising agreement. Um, as the city clerk said, uh, this agreement provides Benchcraft the right to sell advertising to play, be placed on printed materials and then on equipment that be, would be placed on Lincoln's uh, five municipal golf courses. Um, there is a revised agreement that is before the council this afternoon and sections uh, 2A through K um, have been added and those are um, uh, restrictions on the types of advertising that could be sold or placed on those and Benchcraft has agreed to those. Uh, those ad those uh, restricted advertising categories or advertising types are consistent with the advertising agreement for the StarTran bus system. And um, it's my understanding that, that this change, and perhaps one additional one, will be subject to a motion of, to amend. Uh, the initial term of this agreement is for two years. There'd be the option to extend it for an additional two-year period by council action. And the city will receive, uh, assuming that this agreement is approved, the city will receive $20,000 in compensation annually, in addition to the other items uh, that the golf program will be receiving. And we anticipate directing these proceeds to capital improvements on the courses. So this, this will help make a little bit of that deficit up that we're struggling with to try to get capital improvements made on the courses. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Questions? John. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, a couple questions on it. It talks in here in item three about the city. The staff will do occasional ad sign replacements and there'll be compensation for the time and so forth. Uh, does that come out of the city's 20,000 share or does that come out of the total revenues? It would, <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, it would be city responsibility to do that and then they we would get reimbursed for those expenses. Uh, there's a provision within the agreement that says that typically bench crap would be responsible for doing that work, but if they choose to ask the city to do it, then uh, then they would, would pay us for that work. And as far as, uh, say there's weathering or something of signs, depending what they say on a bench or something, what, are the, um, what would happen, say the contract goes two years, at the conclusion of removal or what have you, how does that get handled to make sure that um, it's just not a graffiti type or a, a, uh, not hey, appropriate. Yeah, great question. Yeah, if this uh, agreement is to expire or were to expire, we would remove these items from the course, or at least we would take the advertising off of them. Um, we had a prior agreement, and it's probably been maybe eight or ten years ago, that uh, through that agreement we had granite T markers that were placed on, on the courses. There's a place at the base of those where advertising is allowed, and actually Benchcraft will be given the opportunity to, to sell and place advertising in those positions. 
on that contract when it expired, we took the advertising off. We left the uh, the team markers in place, but we took the advertising signage off of them. And we there would be a similar situation with this this contract. And so, if you have to do that on all of these various uh, team markers or benches or what have you. I could see where that might exceed twenty thousand dollars, or would there be compensation at the conclusion from the um, contract holder? Um, th th to my knowledge, there is not compensation. Of if the city had to do that uh, at the point of the, that that uh, the, the contract were to terminate, there is not a provision in here to remove that or to, to pay the city for that work. Um, that's a good question. My, my concern would be if you go two years, and, and hopefully it'll go longer, but even so, if it went longer, um, it could be very expensive to do that and to make sure you put another, if it's painting or some type of applicant to, application to the uh, material and so forth, that suddenly what you thought was 20000 a year for golf course maintenance or what have you, that it's, it's really eaten up at the end. Yeah, I, I guess I understand the concern. Um, typically, the signage, it isn't <clears throat> difficult to remove. Um, and so um, I, I don't think that we would bear significant expense uh, or significant time in having to remove this in, in the case that, that uh, we needed to do that at the end of an agreement or, or if the, the advertising was not accurate or appropriate. Trent? There are no signs out right now, though. I mean, you you have no benches and no signage out that, right now. That's correct, yeah. yeah. What we have out so there... So they've are, been removed. Yeah. The existing ones are correct. The existing ones are gone. I played two rounds and there's no signs. Carl. Yeah. <clears throat> Len, the, currently we, we have um, scorecards that, that have some marketing on them. And I'm not sure that we have anything else that's marketed. So uh, wh what do we have in place? currently and and how does this differ from what we currently have it's essentially this is we, we've had an agreement with, with benchcraft for a number of years and they did provide the scorecards and they provided the uh, uh, the course guides and and uh, it was a different company who actually worked with the granite tea markers so previously we've had an agreement with benchcraft and they provided us the printed materials this is an essentially an expansion of that existing or that prior agreement that we had and includes uh, putting the the uh, advertising on the granite tea markers and then it also includes placement of the uh, the benches the golf ball washers and the uh, uh, the sign boards at each one of the courses, and then there would be advertising then placed on those those items. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> right, uh, just so you know, I have used uh, Benchcraft advertising on private golf courses for my business, and I can assure you that when uh, they're not going to let those advertising spaces go to waste, they're not going to let them sit there and languish. They will replace them if you if they find an advertiser who wants to use this space, and they're done, they'll find somebody else to use the space, and they will maintain those sign signage very well. In, in my experience. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. Anybody would like to speak to this item? Staff questions. Next item, please. All right, under public hearing ordinances second reading, I'll call item 14, approving the lease agreement between the city, Nebraska Golf and Turf, and Exchange Bank for the lease of 120 golf carts and five utility vehicles for use by the Lincoln Parks and Rec Golf Division. Good afternoon, Lynn Johnson with Lincoln Parks and Recreation again. Um, this is a six-year lease agreement for essentially half of the golf cart fleet. This would be for 120 golf carts. Um, in the past, we've done five-year lease agreements. This one we're extending to a six-year agreement, and we're doing that in part to, to, to try to save some expense. Uh, the total annual lease payment uh, for the six-year period, or, or for each of the six years during this, the lease period, is $74,294.40. And we will pay that from the proceeds from the golf cart rentals. Uh, with this agreement, the city is responsible for fueling the carts uh, for oil changes and for minor preventative maintenance. And uh, this cart lease agreement is based on community pricing that was determined through a bid by Kansas City, Missouri. So uh, we had the opportunity to take advantage of a community pricing uh, program uh, that uh, that. Uh, 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 that, that Kansas City initiated, and then we had the opportunity to um, essentially lease at that same rate uh, based on that agreement. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. 
Thank you. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> So bottom line, I guess, uh, how much per year would the, uh, and these funds would go to the city golf program, right? They how, do. How much per year would you expect to go to the city golf program from the rental of golf carts? The, the, the entire fleet, the 240 vehicles, in general, typically we generate about $800,000 a year that helps support the municipal golf program. Uh, so this will be, will be half of that fleet, so it should be about $400,000 that will come in through, through rental of these carts. Yeah, and then plus the expense of <clears throat> roughly 100000 or something. And it's, okay, be, so yeah. maybe, okay, thank you. Any other <clears throat> questions? Len, just off the top of your head, what, if we couldn't have got the community pricing, do you know what that would have cost us? Um, Doug, I, I honestly don't. I'm sorry. Um, I, I'm not sure that I know what their, their standard price was and then, unfortunately, what, what, how much discount we but received by. This, this seems like a good deal because we're able to get them at a, at a reduced price. Correct. Yeah, okay. yeah. We were able. We participate in the, in that community pricing program, and then one of the communities bids it, and then makes that price available to other communities. And gotcha. Kansas City was the community, and obviously a large community. So we think that they've told us that this was a very competitive rate. All right. Thank you very much. Anybody else who'd like to speak to this item? Next item, please. All right. I'll call items 15 and 16. They are annexation. 15002 amending the Lincoln corporate limits map by annexing approximately 10.27 acres of property generally located at Tall Grass Parkway and Astor Road and change of zone 05085B amending the Fallbrook planned unit development by expanding the boundary of the PUD by approximately 10.27 acres approving a change of zone on said 10.27 acres from AG Agricultural to R3 residential designated said 10.27 acres as a planned unit development district and approving an amended development plan which proposes modifications to the zoning ordinance and land subdivision ordinance to allow a townhouse development east of tall grass parkway consisting of 36 <clears throat> dwelling units on property generally located at tall grass parkway and astor road Come right on up. David Carey with the Planning Department. I'm here not as the applicant, but I don't believe the applicant is here today to speak. I just wanted to make sure it was clear that um, I'm here to ask, answer any questions you might have, but also to state that this is the uh, fairly straightforward next phase of the of the Fallbrook development, uh, including mm -hmm. the annexation and the change of zone. Anybody like to speak to this item? Come right on up. <clears throat> my one question is please state your name and address right. Wanda Meyer my address yes 5020 South Street Lincoln. thank you okay. my one question I guess it's kind of directed to the planning but on these say uh, zone changes and these annexations and these developments is there any property tax money that is funneled to the development or the developers for these types of projects? Does anyone know? Property tax dollars collected on existing property funneled to property developers or, uh, or the ilk or the like for these types of properties, specifically when they decide to rezone ag land for residential, you know. Generally speaking. Does anyone know the answer to that? I think we have several qualified people in the room. Uh, Mr. Carey, being planning director, would you like to answer it or? I'll yeah, sure. uh, I, I'll try to answer it. I think the, the question is meant in general. The, 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 the process that we have in place when we have development occur and then subsequently annexation and change of zones for new developments to happen, there's not a, uh, a direct funneling of <coughs> proceeds from, from property taxes going to developers in that sense. The way that uh, public improvements are, uh, are made when it comes to growth in the community, 
um, there are tax dollars that go towards public improvements, um, but generally speaking, those improvements are needing to have public, wider public benefits, such as arterial streets and water and sewer improvements like and, and such. Uh, and then the internal improvements for those developments are responsible for their own improvements, uh, the local connections and the local extensions of services. So I know that's a very general way of explaining that, but that would be the way that as far as how development happens, that is more or less how it would, would occur. There are public dollars that go to serve the expansion of the community, but as far as when annexations occur and changes of zone occur, there aren't those direct payments in that sense. What you, what you might do is relate it to this instant case. Let's say we're developing your area on South Street. Tip. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, let's just pretend that yours is new, just so you can I, I visualize it, that South Street would be an arterial. The city would pay to do that. There would probably be some street construction funds, maybe federal monies and all, but that would be paid there. But say <coughs> land on either side, an interior street, say between South and Van Dorn or something, and 48th and 56. Interior-wise, the developer would pay for all those streets and the interior circulation of infrastructure. Right. Does that help? Yeah, I just wanted to know what the connection was because I, I've heard a lot about hmm. yeah. property tax dollars actually do go to that. Ma'am, you need why don't you come up here so we not talking to the. You, well, there's another one over here. At this we'll work out. Carl, do you have a question? Yeah. Go ahead. No, when <clears throat> when she's done. Okay, well, basically, I'll just restate what I said. I'm, um, I'm very into, uh, into an in-depth study on, on ICLA and Agenda 21, which I know you are very familiar with, Mr. Camp, because I've read past council city meetings uh, logs. And property tax dollars has a way of being funneled to new developments. And I'm wondering, you know, if that's, it's like, which come first, you know? Did the property tax dollars go to like, okay, let's just redevelop this piece of farmland out here and then uh, it'll attract developers or did a developer say, you know, I'd really like to develop this proper, this piece of tra uh, farmland out here and how about you anteing up and putting out the property tax dollars and our, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, citizens dollars to develop it up to a certain point so then I can come in and develop you see what I'm saying okay. Carl I, I'm talking to mr. Carey here <laughs> any, yeah. any other mm -hmm. questions for, okay <clears throat> all right David um, this particular issue that we have uh, concerns Fallbrook an existing neighborhood uh, and, and as I see the plan, it comes off of one of the main roads in Fallbrook. It's kind of a small contained area. Looks like it's 36 townhomes. Uh, knowing the price of things in Fallbrook, it's probably $10 million, something like that for those. Yeah, I don't have the total improvement cost, but it's, it'll, <clears throat> it's a you know, fairly substantial amount of investment into the improvement. And, and the, the, this isn't like in the middle of a cornfield somewhere way far away. This, this is attached to, to an existing uh, neighborhood development that already has something like 18, 180, what is it, 180 units? No, more than that. Substantially more than that, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> 1,800 units, yeah. So j just the context of, right. of yeah, what we're I mean, looking at. I, I think part of what you're saying is that the um, public infrastructure is already <coughs> in place. In the case of Fallbrook, we have the main streets that have been improved. Uh, water and sewer extensions have been made to that, which is why we've had those 1,800 units as well as commercial developments happen already. Um, so in a general sense, this is a small piece of the further development of this area that was already part of the generalized plan when it was first approved many years ago. Okay. And they, they, as my understanding of the, with this uh, development, that uh, there are, are different segments that are being developed right. periodically. So there's this one coming. There might be some others coming in the future as, as it continues to grow. Correct. And then, then stepping <clears throat> back even further, this area was identified many years ago now that of, a, of a next phase of, of new development, which would have been the, the cornfield development type of example. And that was thought through at the time of the comprehensive plan. And so this is all in line with that kind of 
um, methodical and informed growth pattern okay. that we do have here. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Unlike other communities, David, would it be fair to say that we're not hopscotching around? We are actually finding areas that are contiguous to Lincoln. And the fact, is it not a fact that we have, we have a serious drought of buildable lots at the present time or that our, our backlog of buildable lots is, is virtually gone? Yeah, well, we, I mean, we do have a long history of doing what we call smart development, which right. is we make sure that our infrastructure is funded and available to do that. There's always challenges there financially, but uh, we do a very good job compared to a lot of other communities of not doing leapfrog development and not overextending our infrastructure so that we spend our tax dollars very smartly um, and, and make sure we don't overspend. And not intentionally leaving donut holes right. that are not part of of the, in other words, we're not jumping over somebody's development to, to, to help another developer. We're trying to go outward from the city in a way that makes logical sense based on what we've done with the comprehensive plan. Right, correct. with our growth plan that's in place, correct? I, I will say, ma'am, though, there are areas that we have jumped over because they're acreages and things like that who have asked not to be um, brought into the city and it would be problematic. Uh, one that speaks to mind is the one between um, on on O Street, between O and Holdridge, f from about uh, 88th to 90th, there's 60 acreages in there that are not part of the city, and they're now going to be completely surrounded by the city, but it is going to be extremely problematic to try to figure out how to annex those into the city and how we're going to deal with it. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's any nefarious plan to jump over or to, to, that we're doing anything for developers. I think developers are knocking on our door to try to develop. So, I would just add that developers make a significant contribution. The development community pays something called impact fees. That helps pay for new parks and a lot of the utilities that will be extended to new developments. So they're making a contribution and making a big investment as well. And uh, Mickey, you can fact check me here, but uh, you know we've got wheel tax pay helping to pay for roads. We've got our uh, water rates helping to pay for the extension of water infrastructure. Uh, and, and then in terms of property tax, probably the way that property taxes support new development, considering that most of our property tax dollars go to schools, is that to the extent that new development creates a need for more schools, then eventually, in the longer term, there are new schools built to support that growth. But the idea being that we all pay for that because we all benefit from that. These new developments create new homes that create more property tax revenue. So it's sort of a, a dance between new and old that we share and uh, we, we recognize the, be the benefits of the new development supports our entire city. So that's part of the reason we all feel willing to pay those um, that price. Uh, so do you feel like your question has been answered? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I can, I can follow um, up. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. And, and also before, too, you'll need to sign in there with your name and address for our clerk. There's an orange sheet there before you Thank you. Okay. Anybody else who'd like to discuss this item? Staff questions? Next item, please. All right. Next, I'll call item 17. Approving the transfer of unspent and unencumbered appropriations and cash, if any, between certain capital improvement projects within the street construction fund for the Public Works and Utilities Department. Good afternoon, City Council members. I'm Mickey Esposito, Director of Public Works and Utilities, and it is my great pleasure to introduce the ordinance before you today. Uh, we are asking you to approve a transfer of appropriations within the street construction fund from the Antelope Valley project to the street and highways operating budget in the amount of $1.5 million and the streets and bridge rehabilitation budget in the amount of $8.5 million. As you know, this $10 million um, amount in transportation money is being returned as a result of Antelope Valley finishing under budget, which is great news for the city. In making a determination about where these dollars should go, the department explored various options and needs, including new construction, street rehab, paying off transportation bonds, and buying new equipment and materials. 
Uh, just a short time ago, you might recall, we had two significant pothole surges following some extreme weather conditions. Potholes are a nuisance and a consequence of cracks in the pavement coupled with the freeze-thaw cycle. We've said for a long time that filling potholes is a temporary measure, a band-aid to a problem that deserves a cure. That cure is a combination of robust street rehabilitation, uh, for example, mill and overlay projects, and proper pavement preservation by our maintenance crews. Um, but we need to equip those crews with more efficient tools that bring about more durable results in order to get more bang for the buck. Therefore, from a transportation agency perspective, the highest and best use for this money at this time is to advance additional street rehab projects in 15 and 16, as well as invest in more powerful, efficient, durable tools for road maintenance citywide. Remember, for every dollar invested in street rehab now, we save 5 to 15 down the road. Um, that is our recommendation for use of this money to you today. At this time, I'd like to bring up two of our managers, uh, Ty Barger, Street Maintenance Manager. He's going to speak with you about the equipment and material investments we're proposing. And then Thomas is available, the, our design and construction engineer, to describe the rehab projects we've programmed with this additional money. Uh, Roger, Fran, and I, as well as Ty and uh, Thomas, are also available for any questions that you have. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ty Barger, Public Works Maintenance Manager. Um, I'm going to walk you through a presentation. I apologize. I don't have a hard copy to distribute to you. <coughs> Up first is our truck mounted single operator spray patchers. Um, these are, in fact, very fast. We had a demo of one of these units uh, last week from Knox County. Uh, this is a single operator uh, machine, uh, one person crew. and. Uh, in most cases, the repairs that this equipment makes is permanent. Uh, it operates down to zero degrees Fahrenheit, so over 90% of our year uh, has temperatures that support this, this equipment. And uh, most importantly, it's, it's a, a force multiplier. Uh, with, this, with four of these uh, units, they will be able to entirely cover down on the pothole effort throughout the construction season. Now, this piece of equipment represents a new way of doing business, and, and uh, accordingly, we're, we're going to have a couple different kinds of material that we have not used before, and one of those is going to require uh, specialized storage, a uh, 7,000-gallon emulsion storage system. And on to our milling machines. What you see on the left there is what we currently uh, use to mill away concrete and asphalt. And uh, on the right is the milling machines that we are interested in purchasing. And you can see there's a substantial difference in the performance of these two pieces of equipment. And our mini asphalt paver, we want to uh, purchase two of these units. Uh, when used in conjunction with the milling machine that you saw on the previous slide, we'll be able to complete lane width repairs very, very quickly. Uh, we currently have no pavers in our inventory the work that's done by this machine that you're looking at on your monitor is currently uh, accomplished with shovels and rakes. It's very labor intensive. And on the left hand side, side of this slide, you can see our current rollers that we use as compared to the rollers that we intend to purchase. You see, it's almost uh, a double in the centrifugal force of the larger roller. And obviously, with a heavier, more powerful roller, you're going to have more compact and, and longer lasting repairs. On the left hand side of this slide, you see our current tar kettles. We have two tar kettles like that, and a couple that are just a little bit smaller. Um, while not the exact same function as the new poly patch applicator that we, that we are interested in, they operate similarly. The new poly patch applicator uses a polymer modified asphalt. Uh, it's got more of a rubber consistency uh, and it bonds better to the pavement and provides a much longer lasting repair. And all three of these images are taken here in Lincoln. You can see on the far left a very 
uh, degraded road. And in the middle, you can see what's uh, more often not the patchwork that we put in place. This is uh, due to the capabilities of our equipment. And on the far right hand side, you can see the approach that we want to take. Uh, even with our best work, our, our best repair work, each one of those seams around that repair uh, presents a, a liability where it could fail and, and we'll have to come back. So lane width repairs uh, when warranted is, is the best approach for longer lasting repairs. And I will be available for any questions you have. John. Thank you very much, Mr. Barger. Um, and I, I would tend to agree with you being a non engineer and all that that lane width is a good way to do it so you don't have those expansion joints or those cracks do you have you showed us uh, photographs there of several pieces of equipment do you have a breakdown of how much you're proposing out of that million and a half dollars to go to each type of equipment I do have that i can look for it but can you yep. yeah. and just for reference to in the future could we have the we've asked before if we have something right written at the presentation that we would have during it as well so if you just make a note it really helps us for hard copy hard copy okay. for the council members certainly sure. would you like for me to go through the the, the yeah the i would the i would be curious because i don't have no idea what each piece of equipment yeah. costs and how many of each and so the, forth this unit here the the, the um here. spray patcher oh very good there you go. right up there. and it'll pop up They're working on it. It's kind of slow. Okay. What you can see on the uh, overhead now is the price per unit for each of the different uh, items that. I well, you're going to have to yeah. make that a heck of a lot bigger for us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How's that looking? It's good. Great. Getting better. <clears throat> better. Right there. Okay. Yeah. The uh, most expensive item is the. Spray patcher, $215,000 per unit. Hmm. The emulsion tank, 100000 You can see all the figures in there. Okay. We also have a document to show um, the current way we're doing business and uh, the cost comparison to what we would save uh, with respect to the spray patchers, if you'd like to see it. I just don't know what other questions you have. Well, I would have a, uh, now see it, going through your presentation, I understand the idea of going to lane width repairs or maintenance or improvement, and then off, uh, beyond that too, you do your remilling and so forth of asphalt, which I think is a good approach. I would question, we're at the end of the season here, we had the 13,000 potholes. Uh, I would question buying four of these pothole fixers or patchers from the standpoint we're, we're at the end of the season. and. Um, uh, that's a half million dollars for two of those if we couldn't do something with two and then use the monies to either rehab other streets and go toward the full lane equipment to <coughs> rehabilitate those streets yeah, we hear your question uh, you're asking whether we need the full four uh, spray patchers yeah. right and I think that, we that's have a, a good remedial answer. Retro, you know, mm -hmm. uh, reactive approach and why not put the money into being proactive well, two, two parts to that question. One is we have to go through the procurement process to obtain the spray patchers, to obtain the equipment um, anyway. So there will be sort of a purchase down the line. Um, we're not looking at purchasing them right away. Um, we would have to go through the procurement process first, and then the equipment would have to be built for us. So it might be uh, sometime before we get them. And then the second part of that is that currently, again, like Ty was saying, there's a, it's a force multiplier. And four crews being able to be replaced with four trucks, the single operator trucks, means that I get to, we get to move three to four men to more preventative maintenance, like crack sealing, um, use, utilizing the other pieces of equipment that we'd like to purchase with this 1.5 million. Um, I don't know if you have additional things to add relative to the no, I just wanted to reinforce uh, a number less than four would result in us having to dedicate uh, more employees on pothole repair throughout the construction season instead of doing the crack sealing and other preventive maintenance that they need to be focused on. So that, that is the point of, of uh, four units. You know, one unit certainly would be a benefit to us. Four 
allows us to focus and redirect our manpower elsewhere. Could you say that again? Yes. So. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> I'm trying to follow. I'm trying to follow where you're. Four okay. spray patchers. Yes. We'll be able to take care of the pothole effort throughout the construction season. Okay. Without any additional manpower. Okay. So all that manpower that would otherwise be working potholes will now instead be doing crack sealing and preventive maintenance and complete repairs. So pothole prevention. Okay. They'll be so yeah. the truck mounted stuff's going to be doing pothole prevention, but I think you just said that you weren't going to be buying them right away. <clears throat> no, the uh, we have to go through the procurement process to get the equipment, and then the yeah they have to. But okay. we would expect this summer that they would be here. Okay. When and I meant now, I meant they're not going to be here in March. Okay. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I was. I was thinking sure. to myself that like you were saying something about maybe Del not having in them right away, <laughs> thinking that they might be purchased in September, but that, that, no. uh, what, that what? gets me beyond my, okay. okay. On the question of four, um, what's the strategy around four? I mean, this is a new piece of equipment. Um, I'm assuming that there's going to be some, uh, you know, thought about how you use all four of those. Is that the right number or can it explore, can it give me, uh, take me where to how you got to four? Okay, well, the starting point is uh, business as it has been in the past, and that's we have to dedicate 10 full-time employees to pothole repair throughout the construction system. Okay. And more in the wintertime. Yeah. Uh, so the focus is the construction season, being able to free up as many personnel as possible. How many spray patches would it take to completely cover down on the pothole effort throughout the construction season? And uh, crunching numbers with my staff, we determined that four is the minimum number that we need in order to be able to free up those employees completely during the construction season. Mm -hmm. So whereas we normally have 10 and 10, 10 employees focused on pothole repair throughout the construction season, in the future, we would need only four. Four operators, four of those spray patchers. So those additional six employees are freed up to work on preventive maintenance and permanent repairs, larger repairs, like those lane width repairs that I showed you. Okay. Larry. I had some questions about uh, the quality of materials and also just the methods for filling a pothole. Someone had mentioned that, you know, when you put material mm -hmm. in a wet, dirty pothole, mm -hmm. it doesn't stay. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about how the trucks will address this or if they do improve upon this I believe there's a, some some technology there that we'd love to hear about and also um, whether or not this new emulsion is different from what we use currently okay um, and I think that that cost comparison that you had mm. um, if you can pull that up oh sure. so your first question is what kind of technology do we use today? And we have a combination of cold mix and hot mix um, that is manually applied uh, by three to four people. Um, basically, it's, it's out of a hot box and they shovel it into the pothole and slap it down and then they move along. Um, and it requires, it's very man intensive or crew intensive. Um, and it's also, um, they're out in the street working. It's not as safe as a single operator unit. And then, Larry, and remind me of your second question. Well, actually, the first question, the okay. demonstration that some of us were able to attend of this new truck, it looked like the, um, the arm of it mm -hmm. blow dries the pothole first. <laughs> yes. So, can you just explain? You want me to walk through the yeah, steps well, of just, the... Well, just to address, I mean, sure. I did get questions about this, uh, and it does seem like a change from how we operate today mm -hmm. that may, in <clears> fact, <throat> make these pothole repairs more permanent. So if that's true, I'd like to know. You bet. Okay. So, and Ty can correct me if I'm wrong, but the first stage is it, it blows out the hole completely, so to, it dries that area. So if it's full of moisture, it can, it can dry it. Um, and then it puts in a uh, emulsion or a primer down. And that's so that the um, asphalt material bonds better uh, to the pothole from underneath. Um, once that goes down the tar and the uh, asphalt material goes in, then an aggregate is placed on the top. And the bond is stronger. Um, it doesn't pop as easily. It's supposed to secure cracks um, and fill cracks so that there's not a lot of moisture going in, subject to freeze-thaw cycles, which pot 
pop more potholes. Um, currently, uh, the vendor has suggested this last, you know, two to five years. Um, our, our potholes with cold mix today can be <clears throat> two days to two months, depending on freeze thaw and, and moisture conditions. So do you have anything else you wanted to add as far as the technology enhancements of the, the the patcher just that uh you know emulsion is a new way of doing business we've not done the city has not done business in that way in the past um it's essentially mostly the same stuff that we have used previously asphaltic petroleum only it's mixed with water and some other additives that allow those two things to mix together in a solution uh, it's much more uh it's a much lower viscosity than our normal uh tar that we use and it has some bonding characteristics that increase the strength and, and of the bond between the patch and the, and the existing pavement. And as I said, there's a couple of different uh, material requirements that we will have to uh, consider, some additional overhead. I think ultimately it's going to be cheaper per pothole, significantly cheaper, but there are a couple of different products that we're going to have to store and maintain. Uh, one of those is chip granite uh, aggregate, small, uh, chip granite, and additionally the, the emulsion. So this is a, um, a graphic that was created. We tried to do as much to apples and apples as we could, taking the current practices um, with you know, our four-man crews and then the future uh, single operator unit. Um, and you can see the cost differential there. Um, however, a lot of people have asked, well, does this mean you're going to reduce FTEs? And absolutely not. We need those FTEs doing more crack sealing. And that's the point. So whatever savings we realize here, we're going to be working on more preventative maintenance um, so that our roads stay in better condition in the future. Uh, and what we gain is, is durability and longevity of that road and that investment. Is that where Fibercrete comes into play, you, the product that you have described in the past? And can yeah, that will be that? another tool in our toolbox. Um, we had a so the, the tow behind gravity discharge poly patcher applicator. That um, is fibercrete, which is a product, uh, <clears throat> gap mastic, it's been called as well. And um, we applied that on 70th and LaSalle. It was a good project, so you can go see it and see how it works. But it's more durable, long lasting, it's very effective, and the shutdown of the road is much shorter. Um, so I think we did that in half a day, Thomas, is that correct? The fibercrete. So. Trent. I appreciated that other graph uh, it's just to see that because it basically means that in three years those um, whatever you call them machines um, will pay for themselves. It is as a big far investment. As, as, yes. as far as your delta that you're going to hit there and allowing you to take resources from this and put them into other important things that if you would have shown me that at the beginning, I would have been like, oh, okay, it makes sense. I'm sorry. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I enjoyed seeing that. That was a good graph to put up. We'll get all of this information to you as well before the Great. vote next week, but um, mm -hmm. it is an important graph, yeah. It, yeah. it shows just an efficiency, a cost efficiency yeah. that we can get. It shows that you guys did your homework on this, and that's great. Thank John. you. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to understand the relationship of going to the full lane repairs or, or relaying it, which eliminates all the potholes. Uh, and so it seems to me you're going to be building up a less need for the, uh, the four apparatuses, the pothole fillers. And that's just where I'm really not tracking with you that, you know, you can say on paper it saves you, but if you're using all this other equipment to do those full lane repairs, plus you go, do the remilling and other things, we go to more asphalt that can be rolled out so that you don't have any cracks at all seems to me that's being very preventative yeah. and yet you're focusing a million dollars here on a regressive pothole filler. Mm -hmm. I think if we uh, are able to get ahead of potholes in such a way that we can decommission some of our equipment, I think that would be a very good problem to have. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to be there in the next year and uh, I think as we get to a point where we can transition some spray patches away from pothole repair, they can absolutely be utilized in other capacities. They can be used to 
uh, also crack seal and, and other functions. So the equipment's not going to go to waste regardless. And it's a 10 to 15 year life on the equipment. Um, and Ty is right, as our priorities and needs change, we can certainly invest it somewhere else and as far as equipment. But right now, we have a lot of potholes <laughs> to fill. And we have a lot of crack ceiling needs. We have to find a way to do more with less, and this is, this is our proposal. Well, that's where I, just, well, <coughs> the, uh, I know your maintenance on that equipment was fairly heavy there on your graph that you just had a chart. Um, uh, could you address what you're looking at doing as far as, you know, I've been questioning the use of so much brine and getting the salt mixture down into the concrete, into the surface, and then keeping that temperature, freezing temperature higher, and as a result you get more moisture there, which then gets into the material of the street and then promotes potholes. What you're doing on that, uh, I know sealing cracks would be one good step, but can you address how this approach that you're using with this million and a half of equipment would help? Well, it's going to, do you want me to take a chance at that? It's exactly. actually going to seal and, and um, a little bit better and be a little bit more durable um, to prevent moisture from getting in those cracks. Um, so if you can prevent moisture from getting in a crack, you're going to prevent potholes. And that's the simplest way I can put it. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? questions? Thomas, is, do you want to see a list of rehab projects for 15, 16? I'll yield to the chair that would if you be want to. It's a, it should be relatively quick, but if you're curious. Yeah, that's fine. All right, thank you, sir. It's right here in front of you. Oh, it is? Um, Schaefer with the design and construction section of Public Works. Um, <clears throat> My exciting news is I don't have anything new in technology, but we are going to be able to address at least 10 uh, segments on an earlier basis because of these funds. Um, they would be uh, three segments of 27th Street, that being from Highway 2 up to Woods, uh, or 27th Street from Highway 2 to Woods, 27th Street from Alpha to Holdridge, and 27th Street from uh, Fletcher to I-80. Also, uh, 84th Street from Elizabeth to Market, Normal from 33rd to 56, Old Cheney from Warwick to 40th, 56 from South to Normal, South from Normal to 42nd, Superior from uh, I-180 over to 27th Street, and West O from Northwest 28th to, to North 3rd. And uh, the exciting part is this, is those have all been on our radar for some time. This money allows us to get to them one to two to maybe even three years earlier than we would have, which then means the funding that was out three years from them allows another street to move up. And by no means, if you didn't hear your street on here, does that mean it won't be worked on? With this uh, new equipment that Ty's been talking about, street maintenance should be able to get to f more places than they've been getting to as well in the past. So we should be able to get to more streets than we have, which is good news. John. I have a question on there. It says these, you list uh, for fiscal year 2014-15 for roadway and bridge rehabilitation projects such as, and I read that to be exemplary. Are you saying these will be the ones that have the high priority? These are the ones that we're planning on doing. Of course, we haven't taken bids yet, and so until we do so, we won't know the exact cost. We just talked about 36th Street coming in 25% higher than what we estimated. We hope we don't have to cut any, but if uh, bids were to come in under, we'll be able to add another street to it. Would this be the priority list in this order? I'm just trying to think so we know and citizens often look at these and they say, well, you said you're going to do West O and yet it was number 10 or something on the list and you ran out at number 8 and just want to know what we can let our citizens expect. Well, these are still, these are still the priorities and I don't know if I would say they're in order. It'll depend on what we can get bid out first, second, and third. Um, each project has its own things. What they would do if we were to run over, that would be the next one that we'd still do. However, it means something else doesn't get pulled up in that year three like we would have hoped to. We would have had to uh, delay off. And, uh, you know, rehab is an ever-changing list. I'd like to say we have a one-set list that never changes, but each year the weather conditions bring something new that we have to react to. So generally you're saying these, the generally ones you'd like these, to do? Generally so these, generally, um, as much as we can, we're going to get through here. Um, yeah, they're probably pretty much in order. Okay. 
<laughs> and these are from the CIP, right, Thomas? That, these are from the CIP that we've already voted on in the budget season. Well, the, the rehab, the rehab pot is in the CIP, but we do okay. not put in projects okay. in an order. We do it with the such as, it's just like it okay. says. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Anybody would like to speak to this item? Please come forward. Watchdogs of Lincoln government, you could save taxpayers money by not running air conditioning when it's 50 degrees outside. It is cold in here. Um, we are opposed to uh, this purchase because uh, we are opposed to taking the money out of the Antelope Valley project because money is still owed on the project and the feds have been given information that there were inconsistencies or inappropriate expenditures in the budget of the money that they gave to the city and they may be asking for this back again. Um, it's inconceivable to the rational mind that some project can come in under budget when uh, these facts are being found or being um, given by responsible people to members of the public. Um, Whose money uh, is being returned on this uh, matter of coming under budget? Was it federal money? Was it city money? Um, whose money was it? If it's federal money, then uh, the taxpayers of Lincoln are in danger of having to pick up the bill if the feds demand the money to be returned to them. So you are approving or you have the proposal to spend money that uh, you may not have if uh, these, this instance comes to fruition. And then who's going to have to pay for that? Of course, the taxpayers will have to. So I would say that Watchdogs thinks that it would be prudent for you to not approve this expenditure at this time until all of those facts are examined and um, the protection of the taxpayer is in effect or in place. Otherwise, um, we will be robbing Peter to pay Paul. Anybody else would like to speak to this item? Roger, do you want to come up and if you have information? Roger Fired Public Works. Um, thank you, Jane, for giving us an opportunity to reinforce that those, those answers have been taken care of. Clearly, um, the questions raised in the federal audit, FHWA has completely finished their audit, and uh, approximately a year ago, they went through their own internal audit, FHWA and NDOR, and they have sent letters to the city of Lincoln rectifying and closing out 10 of those 12 projects. There's two projects still going. Uh, currently, the uh, Department of Roads is actually managing those projects. They will have their own separate audits. Based on that information from those audits, we spent the last year reviewing all of that information and making sure that the Antelope Valley Project Manager, the Antelope, or the Java Board, uh, that it was correct and true that those dollars were no longer needed. That information was reviewed and then discussed over the last couple of months. Uh, clearly, the Java Board was presented that information and last week passed a resolution acknowledging 
that those projects are done, the audits are complete on those parts, and that the city, the NRD, and the university each individually would accept back those projects that are theirs to own and operate, and any remaining monies would be returned to the contributor. So clearly those audits are done, and the community doesn't need to worry about those dollars. Those are real dollars, and they have been returned back to the city to make best investment. Um, the city, with those monies returned clearly, uh, the city has a long-standing policy. Numerous projects are funded from different sources of revenue. Antelope Valley certainly had a number of them. The significant ones, federal aid, state gas tax, and parts of our own wheel tax. In each of those and over the years, the city has a policy and a practice that if there are strings or requirements for funds, those funds are used for those particular uh, activities and the type of projects first. All of the federal aid money and the demonstration money was used up front and, and, and extended. Even some of that that was made additionally available, we, we had additional appropriation. We were able to save that and move that out to the South Beltway to reduce the city's encumbrance there. Likewise, the wheel tax for Construction was also spent up front and used on the new roadways and bridges that were built. So any remaining money coming back to the city would be state gas tax money, the city's state gas tax money, or our own wheel tax residual, which by statute and city ordinance, we can use those for any part of our transportation system, be it operation, maintenance, rehab, or new construction. So those are the dollars that come back, and under that case, in all cases, the council approves budgets every year and they appropriate money. And since that money, like any other transfer that we'd bring to the council once a year, the project finished under budget. And we are now making recommendation for those monies to go to our next highest priority. And you would be free to move those monies to those categories. Thank you. And how much so, was returned so to the federal government? None, because we maximized all of the federal aid that was earmarked for Antelope Valley, all of the federal aid that was obligated to the project, and we even found there was that additional $6 million, which was eligible to be used for city project activity, and we moved that to the South Beltway to reduce uh, our 20%, part of our 20% obligation. We wouldn't want to give any of the federal money back. All of those issues that were, were raised were resolved and answered to the satisfaction of the Federal Highway Administration, which is responsible for all of those federal dollars that came to Antelope Valley on the transportation project. Okay. Thank you very much. Next item, please. Next item, please. That would conclude our public hearing portion. We can move into the voting session. Public hearing resolutions, item 11, amending the fiscal year 1415 CIP to authorize and appropriate $374,000 in TIF funds for the Swanson Russell redevelopment project introduced by Cook. So, so moved. moved. Second. Moved by Trent, seconded by Carl. Discussion? Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 12, authorizing acceptance of the low bid to Bryn and Jones, which is in excess of 25% over the estimate for the 36th and Gladstone Paving District 2631. Introduced by Gaylor Baird. So moved. Second. Seconded by Carl. Discussion? <laughs> you know, this is a tough issue, but I, I appreciate Mike Harris stepping forward um, and uh, doing some work to ease the burden of this project. And um, uh, you know, it's it's really a it's really a tough one since we've gone through the the hearing on this one. But I intend to support it. I would I would add that. Um, to reiterate what you said about Mr. Ayer's contribution, making it possible for the residential, uh, the residential um, folks to pay residential prices as opposed to commercial grade pricing, which was originally proposed. And then also to Roger Feigard for working on increasing the city's subsidy. I'm concerned that if we don't support this today, this, this might be the best deal they ever get. And um, 
it might not come back around again. So I think this is, while very difficult, um, we've had a lot of back and forth in it, and uh, I'm plan I plan to support it as well. Anybody else? Well, the truth is, is that the, the paving district doesn't go away. If we vote against this today, uh, Mr. Ayers, because he owns uh, over 51 percent of the frontage could bring this back up again it goes back up for bid and at that point um, we may be ha paying higher fees and and Mr. Ayers might not be uh, in quite such a giving mood the next time it may end up costing you more I uh, to, at the end of the day uh, I said a week ago this was not going to end with a win-win for everybody um, it's going to be a little bit painful for everybody and I I, I think that the city stands to benefit too because it may open that uh, I uh, that package of I uh, ground that is to the uh, south of of the project so I think there are pluses to it um, will it will it raise uh, people's property values absolutely uh, but that means it's also worth more if you sell it so um, there are pluses and minuses uh, let's call please have the vote please Eskridge Yes. Bellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 13 is the advertising agreement with Benchcraft Company, introduced by Christensen. So moved. Second. All right, we do have a motion to amend number one to accept the substitute agreement. I move motion to amend number one. Second. Uh, moved by Larian, seconded by John. Do you want to discuss that, Larian, real quickly? Um, this was to try to make sure that we have consistent language across different advertising agreements that the, the city engages in. So um, this substitutes the agreement with language already used in a StarTran uh, policy. Okay. Discussion on the amendment. Call, call a roll, please. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes carried six to zero then we have motion to amend number two to amend the advertising agreement I'd like to move motion to amend number two second <laughs> seconded by Trent just go ahead Marion okay well sometimes the fine print jumps out at you when you read these contracts and and this is one of those cases where when we got the revised language borrowing from our policy with StarTran uh, it it came to my attention that we were prohibiting advertising of feminine hygiene products. And in discussing this with law, there was really no um, uh, understanding of how long this had been in place or even why it was there. No one seemed to have any objections to removing it. My thought here is that the city really doesn't need to be signaling to women and young girls that there's, this is anything to be embarrassed about. And they certainly don't need another reason to be self-conscious about their, their bodies. So we'd like to do away with this. And, and to do away with this, not just with the, the Parks and Recs agreement that we're proposing, but, but going forward with other city advertising policy. Okay, discussion? Call the roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. <clears throat> Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Public hearing ordinances second reading are items 14 through 17. Oh, I'm sorry, main motion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Discuss, Eskridge? Discuss sorry. On, discussion on the main motion, please. None here, none. Go ahead. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Ordinances second reading then are items 14 through 17. Ordinances third reading. Item 18 is annexation 15001, amending the Lincoln corporate limits map by annexing approximately 22 and a half acres of property generally located at North 94th and Adams Street. Introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Second by Trent. Discussion? Call a roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Item 19 is change of zone 05054B, application of Storos Lewis to amend the Prairie Village North planned unit development to expand the area of the PUD by changing the zoning from agricult AG Agricultural to R3 Residential PUD 
and for approval of amendments to the development plan to allow for an additional 155 lots for residential dwelling units on property located at North 90th and Adams Street. Introduced by Camp. So moved. Second. Seconded by Trent. Discussion. Call a roll. Eskridge? Yes. Fellers? Yes. Gaylor Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. Resolutions first reading are items 20 through 25. Ordinances first reading are items 26 and 27. We have no items on either pending list. And anyone wishing to address the council on a matter not on this agenda and not plan to appear on a future agenda may do so at this time. Spring break. brothers are in town so I'm gonna do demonstration but I'm gonna do old school I don't know how to do the computer stuff I don't want to know Terry Pope Gonzalez 349 South First Street Lincoln Nebraska 68508 this here is a milk jug um, I do um, church on Sunday in my kitchen with the little kids at the city mission now this is what the little kids, now you guys know about blue balls, so we'll get to those later, okay? Right now, and the, and the black bags, so we're gonna put these here, this is what we're gonna do. I have a little girl, she made me this. Guess what this is? This is her with a machine gun because her daddy, who's a doctor, beat up her mother. That's what this is. This little boy here that did this one, you have to remember my son's almost 40 years old, so I don't have any toys. So we have to come up with whatever I have. My husband is an iron worker, so we always have duct tape, right? This here is a little boy who doesn't want, this is, this is Air Force One. He doesn't want the president to come, he wants the grandmother to come, because the grandmother takes care of things. Because this little boy is eight also at the city mission, being bullied at school because he has silver teeth. Why do they always give the poor kids silver teeth? They did 50 years ago with one of my brothers. Anyway, when we do our um, voting, we do it in a milk jug. Now this says milk, it's even red and white, right? Look at it, does it look like it's milk? Now that's how they're doing that recycling over that's poison me, right? They, they say it's one thing, but it's not. So what this is, this is about the 911. The little eight year old, you know what he told me? The 911 can't be important because the UNL stamp logo, University of Nebraska Huskers, is not on that. Or the Vision 2015 group is not jumping on board. So it kind of makes sense. It's like, I hear everybody, oh, we're, we're doing all this money, we're doing all this money. Well, how come the 9-11, the 911 thing's not fixed? I went over and talked to my fire station. I actually apologized to them, because them I care about, because the ones coming into the fire is the ones I care about, not the ones running out. So this here, I went door to door, because everybody knows I want everybody to vote. I don't care if you vote for Mickey Mouse, just so you vote. So what I did is I take around and make sure everybody gets um, registered to vote. So if you noticed in our area how many independents we have, because I'm independent. Now last um, election, when the MIG was on, I guess I, I, I did for you, and I did for whoever is whatever you are. I don't know who's what up here, because I'm independent. I wanted, what's his name, Carol? The guy whose last name was Carol, I wanted him gone. I don't like a yes man at all. So I went around, I think I went to the Democratic place and said, listen, I will go door to door. I wasn't on crutches then. So we went door to door. See what this is? And you guys can look at everybody's vote in here. These are black balls. See black balls? You can buy off one, two, three, four, but you can't buy off a whole bunch of black balls. So everybody is saying, we wouldn't mind if the 9-11 was so important, why wasn't it built first? Why wasn't it taken care of first before all these other projects? If you don't have a good foundation, I mean, you can have all the fancy things you want, but if you don't have the workers, it burns to the ground. And somebody in your parking lot gave me some matches. And you know what he said? 
Mama T, we want you to set some fires. I said, oh great, that's all I need. City council, send the cops back to my house. And don't, because my brothers are from Texas and they're not gonna take well with cops showing up at my house. So the cops and I have a new agreement because there's not enough cops, there's not. So if what we did is my neighborhood association put together, there's seven of us. Because in seven, five is a quorum. One minute. Anything over a quorum is a litter. So there's seven of us. We will go take care of the problem. If we can handle it, we will handle it. If not, then the cops will come. But that's what we're gonna do in our neighborhood, just so everybody knows. But see this here? This is recycling. This is our black balls. There's a whole bunch in here. You'd be surprised what's in your neighborhood. But anyway, I just wanna make sure everybody saw this. The little girl wants a machine gun. You know how old she is? She's six, because her daddy is a doctor, beat up her mother. So I just wanted everybody to see, this is what the little kids are making. Now I realize it's real crude, but I don't have Legos. You know, maybe somebody needs to give me some Legos so these kids can build other things. But anyway, thank you for your time and my presentation. We actually, if we have a trash, we can just throw it in the trash. You guys can see that some of it's your parking tickets. Because I, what I did is I passed them out because I want to make sure everybody starts coming. And what happens, they don't know how to come and do the parking garage. So anyway, I think I'm done. And Doug Emery, I know that you want me to be done. But anyway, this is my demonstration. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak? Come right on down. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, and honey, I'm sorry, I don't mean to Go be ahead. Away. Okay, my name is Lewis, Mrs. Lewis. Trash can. And I have microphone a little yep. closer, Pull it please. down to you, there you go. Thank you. Uh, now can you hear me? Yep. That's better. And you can even see me, too. <laughs> <laughs> I wore my Husker red today. Uh, I was planning on addressing with the problems with Star Trek, but I need to start with what happened yesterday. I had a... <clears throat> episode with my heart and I tried to call 911 and it wouldn't go through on my phone. Fortunately, I had the police dispatch number and I got a hold of you people that way and somebody came and picked me up and took me to Brian on South Street. Unfortunately, they forgot to bring my walker with me so when I got back home on the with the cab several hours later the cab driver told me she could not go into the building because I live in a locked building at 17th and J Street. So there I am with no cane, no walker, and nobody who was going to help me into the building. And uh, it was kind of a struggle to get there, but I finally got the elevator. There are two elevators in our building. Most of the time, only one of them is working. And that is a constant problem with us handicapped people, how long we have to wait for an elevator. And by the time we get downstairs, we probably missed our bus because both the 50 and the 53 come at the same time. We no longer have service on the 55 because somebody decided mm -hmm. the handicapped and elderly that lived on the east side of the big tall building with the guy on top didn't need to have service every 15 minutes. I think somebody needs to rethink their bus service. Bus service is there to serve the elderly and the handicapped, and I'm tired of being told that I can have what's left over after the pigs get to the trough and take whatever they think they deserve. Um, my pedigree is I graduated in 62, 66, and 68 cum laude. I'm also an honorably discharged veteran of the United States Air Force. I moved to Lincoln in 2000 because I thought it would be a good place to live. It was flat and had a park system and should be a good place for somebody to retire at. Well, an awful lot of my family has been in the Air Force or some other branch of the service, and uh, every place should be a good place for people to retire at, but unfortunately, people in Lincoln don't seem to think that uh, elderly and handicapped deserve good bus service because uh, I think Mayor Beitler complained that the uh, bus service loses money every year, but that's not my fault. Uh, neither is being handicapped my fault, but uh, unfortunately I'll be handicapped for the rest of my life. 
that building at 1700 J has 100 apartments. You have to be handicapped or elderly to get into it. I waited a long time to get into it. I finally got there. And now they take our bus service away because we no longer have the 55 going every 15 minutes. It no longer goes to the League of Human Dignity. We're supposed to walk across O Street to get to it. Lincoln has the highest pedestrian mortality rate for a city at size of anyone that we've looked at. You need to rethink your bus service for the safety of elderly and handicapped people. They also may have little children with them because there's an awful lot of kids around here whose parents both work. <coughs> Sometimes their grandmother still works. And I don't know who's taking care of the kids, but you know, using the TV as a babysitter unless they're watching PBS isn't a good idea. One minute. I would like to have the 55 bus service back to the other side of the Capitol for <laughs> handicapped people because we would like to not have to wait for 55 minutes for the next bus if we just missed one. The 55 and 53 could be staggered so that they came a half an hour apart. And I would also like to see the 53 and 55 function on Saturdays because Actually, Saturday would be the best day for me to go shopping down at South Point. But the bus doesn't run on Saturdays. There is a way to get down there, but you have to go all the way downtown, transfer to another bus. I'd rather just get on the 53 and know I'm going to get there, and when I get back on the 53, I'm going to get home and I don't have to transfer. Because needless to say, when you're handicapped and elderly, transferring is a real headache. <clears throat> it also hurts at other places besides my head, but that's my problem, I guess. I don't believe that a public bus system is supposed to make a profit. I don't believe it's there for the suburbs where everybody has three and four cars in the driveway and their kids all work at some place so they can all drive themselves anywhere they need to go. The bus Thank is there for people who can't get someplace unless there is a bus. Thank you, ma'am. Mrs. Lewis, what's your first name? Jackie. Thank you. You're Anybody else who'd like to speak? Mr. Chair, seeing no one coming forward, I'd move for adjournment. Second. Second by Trent. Discussion, call a roll. Esprit? Yes. Yes. Mr. Baird? Yes. Camp? Yes. Christensen? Yes. Emery? Yes. Motion carried six to zero. We are adjourned. <laughs>